Well, we're talking this summer about ways to increase our faith. And part of increasing our faith, I think, is going back to some of those very familiar stories and those familiar passages in Scripture that we've known as a kid and that we go, oh my gosh, God is so big. And then for whatever reason or another, we seem to forget that or it's not as, as prevalent. And so I pray that as we go back to this familiar passage, that God would again expand our eyes for just how big He is and how good of a shepherd that He is to us. Now, how many of you have ever had to, or for whatever reason, memorize Psalm 23? As a kid growing up, you ever memorized Psalm 23? And how many of you have ever heard Psalm 23 read at a funeral at all? This is an extremely familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, I had, it was one of the first passages that I had to memorize as a little kid. I've read it at every funeral that I've done. I've heard it read at every funeral that I've done. I've read it at communion services. I've read this at the hospital beds of those who were dying. This is an extremely comforting psalm. That the Lord is my shepherd, therefore there's nothing that I want. And yet as familiar as this psalm is, I know for a fact that you know Psalm 23. But I want to ask you this morning, do you know the shepherd? Because as comforting as this psalm is, it is for those of us who are sheep. Who know the shepherd. That's who this psalm is for. That's who these promises are for. Is for we to know the shepherd. And so I pray that we might know that. This morning. The person that wrote this. David knew all about shepherding. And sheeping. Sheeping. He knew about shepherding and sheeping. And tending sheep. <laughs> In fact David was called the shepherd king. Because he tended sheep. That, that before he was a king. He was a shepherd. And I wondered, as, as Cheryl read this for us this morning, I was thinking about this. Why is it throughout Scripture that we human beings are constantly called sheep? Now, I want to know, I want to tell you that I, I had planned to have this uh, live sheep walk in at this point. However, I was told that uh, number one and number two, they could not say for sure that that wouldn't happen, even though we passed it by Janet, said, oh, bring them on in. But... We had second thoughts about bringing the sheep in. But sheep, I have heard and I have witnessed to some extent, are considered dumb animals in a lot of respects. I've actually seen an account where sheep who were going off a cliff, the other sheep would just follow the sheep right off the cliff, even as they saw the sheep falling to their death. Although they're not so dumb when they're being led, when they have good instruction. Sheep are very much a flock animal. So they like to go in the flock, and yet, in some cases, they wander off and they tend to get lost on their own. And sheep need good shepherds. They need lead. And a good shepherd leads his sheep to good green pasture. And it leads them beside still waters where they can have enough to eat and enough to drink. And a good shepherd goes after a sheep who's caught in the thicket. And a good shepherd goes after the sheep that is lost. That's what the good shepherd does. And that's what our father does. And David's able to say, The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. And David could say that because that was true for him. David knew the father. David knew the shepherd. And we who are on this side of the cross, 2,000 years after the cross, can say that we know the shepherd Jesus. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep know my voice. And again, I want to just uh, reiterate that this is for those of us who know the shepherd. These are not comforting words to those who hear it at a funeral necessarily. These are not just comforting promises to those who had to memorize Psalm 23. But it really is for those of us who know the shepherd. And more importantly, that the shepherd knows us. Because David, even though he was a man of really big sins, he was called a man after God's own heart. He was one that the shepherd knew. And David is able to say, therefore, I shall not want. And I think a better translation is not that I shall not desire, but that there is nothing that I lack. Because God is my shepherd, there is nothing that the Father knows that I need that I lack. 
In other words, that's not saying that you and I have every need that we ever wanted or we have all of our desires fulfilled. But that from an eternal perspective, from God's point of view, there is nothing that we ever have or that we ever will have needed because God is our shepherd. Philippians 4.19 says that God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? That God is working out all things, all circumstances, all financial circumstances. He's working all things together for good to those that love God and who are called according to his purposes. To those that know the voice of the shepherd, God gives us everything that we need from an eternal perspective. And that, that doesn't always feel like we have everything we need because sometimes it's like, God, boy, I'm in really tight straits here. Or God, I wish I could have a lot more of this or of this or of this. And yet God says, no, I'm your shepherd. And I'll give you exactly what I know that you need at this time and in this place. And some of those good things that God provided for David and for us. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And he restores my soul. Isn't that so comforting and so peaceful sounding? I mean, it's very poetic. But for David, this was true. That those really good times, God leads us and he gives us what we need. He provides opportunity for refreshment. He restores us when we've gone astray. And in fact, God is so good to us that he leads us down paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In other words, God shows us the right way to go. And how exactly does God do that? How is it that God leads us down the right path, the paths of righteousness? I think that the simple answer is the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. Right? God's Word. God gives us exactly what we need to know to know God and to know what we need to do to receive salvation. And in fact, Scripture is called a light unto our path. Right? God gives us what we need to know in His Word. And yet, I was thinking about this too. For as exhaustive and as lengthy as the Bible is, it does not tell us every single thing that we need to know for every situation. Right? Has anyone read anywhere in the Bible where it's going to tell you where you should eat lunch after the service today? Right? Or did you read anywhere in the Bible what job you should do? Right? Whether you should be a banker or a farmer, did it say that to you? Or did it tell you exactly what city you should live in, whether you should live in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or Harlemsburg? Right? What happens when we have a decision to make and the Bible doesn't exactly spell it out. How is it that you and I know the will of God and what path we should go down? Let's say, for example, I'll use an illustration for myself. Uh, when I was in high school, I was basically between Westminster College and Grove City College. And I didn't find anything in Scripture that said which college I should go to. Well, how do I make a decision? How do we know the will of God? I want to share with you just briefly what I think is a very helpful biblical checklist when we have to make a decision between two seemingly good things. And the first of which is, is there anything in Scripture that would either prohibit me or encourage me to go to one college or another? The next thing I want to do is I want to be in prayer to God. I'm saying, God, would you show me? Is there, is, is there a way you want me to go? Do you want me to go to Grove City or Westminster? Because God speaks to us through prayer, like Miss Terry said today. And God speaks to us by that still, small voice, by His Holy Spirit that is put inside of us. And so we've got to be constantly in prayer when we've got to know which path to go. I think the next step we have to take is asking godly advice and godly counsel. Who are the people in your life that know the Lord and that can give you good godly instruction? Maybe that's a family member. For those of you who are married, I hope it's your spouse. Remember the line that the Holy Spirit sounds an awful lot like my spouse? <laughs> and that's so true. Or asking a pastor, or an elder, or a friend that you know 
give you godly advice because that's a very important way that God speaks to us is through other believers. The next step that I think you want to take is look for open and closed doors because often God will speak to us by a closed door. So for example, let's say I wanted to go to Westminster College and the only way I could go is if I got a particular scholarship and then I was granted that scholarship. Well, that's a pretty clear open door. Or let's say I wanted to go to Westminster, but they decided they were going to cut the communication program. Well, I wanted to study communication, so that would be a closed door. So you've got to look for open and closed doors, whatever that might be. And then finally, I think God has given us a rational mind for a reason. Sometimes people did certain acts in Scripture simply out of reason. Paul said, well, I wanted to go to Rome, but the gospel was already there, so I went to Spain. Right? So God gives us rationale and reason. And maybe I said, well, my grandparents live in Grove City. My home church was in Grove City. Maybe that's just a reasonable uh, enough of an answer to prayer that I say, okay, I'll go to Grove City. But after you've done all that, and you said, well, there's nothing in Scripture. I'm not seeing open and closed doors. I've been in prayer then here's the really cool thing about the will of God. You can choose either path. Because here it says there are paths of righteousness. In other words, God would have been with me if I went to Grove City College. God would have been with me if I went to Westminster College. He owns them both. God will have been with you whether you decide to be a farmer or a banker. Right? And so if you say, well, well, which one is the will of God? I want to walk right down the center of God. Think about what this text is saying. God is a shepherd, and we are the sheep. And the shepherd leads the sheep into a big pasture. And the sheep have a lot of freedom in that pasture. Right? The shepherd doesn't say, you must eat this particular blade of grass. But there's a lot of freedom. And I think that is so freeing because we always say, God, I want to know exactly what your will is. I want to walk down the center of your will. And God says, I know what you're going to choose, and I know what's best for you, but I'm giving you some freedom. As long as you are seeking first my kingdom and my righteousness, there are sometimes different paths of righteousness. Now, there's only one path to God, and that's through Jesus Christ, the Son. Let's, not, let's get that straight. There's only one way to the Father. And that's through Jesus. But that's so freeing. You say, well, what's the will of God? The will of God for our lives uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5 is that we are to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. And so as long as we're doing that, and as long as we are seeking first God's kingdom, God gives us freedom. But it's all for His name's sake. Where he says, I lead you down the paths of righteousness for his glory. Sure, he has your good in mind, but it's ultimately for the glory of God, for his name's sake. And we can't ever forget that. So God not only leads us down paths of righteousness, but sometimes God's leading takes us straight through the valley of the shadow of death. Now this was, scholars think, a very literal valley that David would have gone through. A big ravine with big cliffs where there would have been predators hiding out in these crevices waiting for a lost sheep to go so it could pounce on it. There would have been robbers and thieves hiding out as well waiting for a shepherd or waiting to get the sheep. So this would have been a literal scary valley. And yet David says, God, I'm going to walk down there and if it's dark, I know ultimately that your rod and your staff is going to comfort me. And I know that you all are very well aware of the valley of the shadow of death. It's those very dark periods of desperation where you're just crying out to God and say, God, it is so dark. It is so difficult. The pain is hurting too much. God, I, please don't take me down the valley of the shadow of death. And I know that some of you have been there in the form of sickness or disease or having a family member deal with sickness or disease or you've had a loved one who has passed away, and you have said, God, I don't know if I can take any more of this. I don't know if I could cry enough tears. God, please don't make me go through the valley of the shadow of death. And yet the ironic thing is, it's in the valley of the shadow of death 
where the shepherd shows up most powerfully. And I know that that's some of your testimony, that when you've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, there was never a time where God felt so real and so powerful. And even though your circumstances said, boy, I should have no peace, yet the God, the good shepherd, has given you peace. Because God is an expert in walking with people through the valley of the shadow of death. And so, however God has led you, God says, I want you to remember my rod and my staff will be with you. And yet that's so weird for a lot of us. Because I love it when God leads me down green pastures and he takes me beside the still waters and he's restoring my soul and he's just energizing me and I just feel filled with his spirit. I love that. And yet I say, God, please don't make me go down the valley of the shadow of death. I know you're ultimately looking out for my good, but God, I don't want any part of that. Right? It's kind of like the marriage vows that many of us took in sickness and in health. Well, God, please give us a lot of help. Please, please help us avoid this sickness. In good times and in bad, God, please, I, I love the good times, but please spare us from all the bad if you would. And yeah, God says, when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, my rod and my staff will be there to comfort you. And I know that I've not been in near the dark valleys that some of you have. But I do know that when I've been in my darkest valleys, that's when I have been able to trust God the most. That's when I know that God has been with me and He's showered me with His presence. And that actually increases our faith in God. And I know that many of you can say the same. And the pastor got me thinking about this, how ironic this is. That if, let's say that God really is your shepherd, the same God that we talked about last week, that we are literally to fear and be terrified of because He is so big and strong and mighty and has so, done so many incredible things. But if that God is your shepherd, then wouldn't it be kind of neat sometimes, on occasion, to go down the valley of the shadow of death, and knowing that your shepherd's going to be there, and his rod and his staff are going to be there, and he's going to show you a side of the shepherd that you wouldn't have seen otherwise, for you to take a risk for God and to see God show up in a powerful, in a mighty, in a miraculous way. God says, no, wait, wait, for, the, wait for my enemies. My rod and my staff are coming out. Isn't that neat to see the bigness and the power of God? Because that's often shown in the valley of the shadow of death. And my encouragement for you is not to be like I so often am. And that's just trying to avoid the valley at all costs. But just go down that path of righteousness. Just go down that, that stream of water, that green pasture. But to be able to take a risk for God and say, God, I'm going to go with you wherever you lead me, even if that's straight down the valley of the shadow of death. And for some of us, that means, God, I'll go to a distant country for you. God, I'll go to a remote island for you. God, I will go to the bank for you. God, I will go back to farming for you. God, I will go after my neighbors in Harlemsburg for you. God, I will go with you to the hospital bed. And God, I will even go with you to the grave. Because I know you are with me. And I know your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I know that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And that's not just that it will follow and tag along. But it's I know your goodness and your loving kindness to me will pursue me all the days of my life. And I know that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What an incredible promise. What an incredible song. If God is your shepherd. And again, I'll say it again. That these promises are true for those of us who know the shepherd. And for those of us who do not know the shepherd, I pray that this morning, if at no other point, that you would recognize your need for the Good Shepherd. Because Jesus Christ paid a very high price to become your shepherd. 
Because did you know that the wrath of God was literally hurling straight for you and straight for me because of our sinfulness? And yet Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, stepped in the way of the wrath of God, went to the cross, and nailed our sin to the cross. That we might be his sheep. That we might know his voice. And that he would be our shepherd. So because of that, I pray that we would respond appropriately. So I pray that you would follow the shepherd. Follow him down the streams of water. Follow him to the green pasture. Follow him on the paths of righteousness. And even follow him through the valley of the shadow of death. Because in the end, they're just shadows. And shadows can't hurt you if God the shepherd is for you. So you can fear no evil. For he is with you. Always. Let's pray.